On August 10, 1990, in Boston, Massachusetts, B.F. Skinner received the American Psychological Association's Special Presidential Citation for Lifetime Contributions to Psychology. On this occasion, he delivered the keynote address for the 98th Annual Convention of the APA. This association has always been very good to me. I went to my first meeting in 1932. Most of you were not yet born, I suppose. My paper was on schedules of reinforcement, believe it or not. <laughs> and I, it was at the very end of the program, and almost everyone had gone home. But uh, one person who stayed was Richard M. Elliott, who four years later gave me my first job at the University of Minnesota. Later, the association provided space for a conference on the experimental analysis of behavior that some of my friends and I had organized, and that became, of course, Division 25. Somewhere along the line, I also received your Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award, and now this, probably the greatest honor in my life. I am extremely grateful. It has been suggested that I might make a few remarks in return. <laughs> I, psychologists, following the philosophers, have looked inside themselves for explanations of their behavior. They have felt their feelings and observed their states of mind and mental processes through introspection. Introspection has never been a very satisfactory process. Philosophers have acknowledged its defects, but argued that nevertheless, it is the only way to self-knowledge. The psychologists tried to improve it. Wundt and Titchener particularly invented brass instruments, as William James called them, to present stimuli the effects of which were to be introspected, and they trained observers. A trained observer, for example, could see red without seeing it as a red object. That was a stimulus error. Watson, of course, attacked introspection in his manifesto of 1913, and I suppose you could say he was successful because at any rate, Psychologists have stopped introspecting almost entirely. Cognitive, cognitive psychologists probably see the representations of reality they talk about. In fact, they say that's all you possibly can see. But I don't think they claim to see themselves processing them, storing them in memory, retrieving them, and so on. Instead, they have resorted to theories. Theories about what is going on in the head or the mind. But the theories have to be confirmed. And the question is, how can you be sure a theory is right until you can see what is the theory about? Well, as you know, most of them have turned for that to brain science. The mind is what the brain does and the brain can be inspected rather than introspected like any other organ. But does the brain really initiate behavior as the mind or self was said to do? The brain is part of an organism and what it does is simply part of what the organism does. It is part of what is to be explained. Now that explanation, I think, can only be found by looking outside the organism, the individual, rather than within. And it is found in three kinds of variation and selection. The first of these was natural selection which explains why we have a body and a brain at all. But there was a difficulty with that. It prepares 
a species only for a future that resembles the selecting past. That fault was corrected by a further evolutionary step, the evolution of operant conditioning, which enabled the environment of the individual to select behavior with contingencies that were not stable enough to work through natural selection. However, one can learn very little in, uh, in a solitary world by operant conditioning, but unless the, you have a, a, a social environment which is a rich set of contingencies of reinforcement and responsible for the elaborate repertoires we all acquire. Cultures also evolve, and that is the third type of variation and selection. Now, if these three external kinds of circumstances explain what the body does, then what is this mind or self supposed to be doing? Does it exist? There seems to be no room for it in a scientific account. It can, you can say it is explained by contingencies of selection and in turn explains behavior, but that isn't necessary. You can skip the thing entirely. Well, let's uh, start again. And we'll start a long way off. Everyone talks about behavior and did so long before there were philosophers or scientists of any kind. We all speak it. It's a vernacular. We call it, it's a proper word to call it. A vernacular is not, not pejorative. It means, as the root meant for the Romans, the language of the household of daily life. We all speak it. It is a language in which newspapers, magazines, and books are published. It's the language of radio, television. When they are talking about the individual, it is a language used by psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists, and economists, all the behavioral sciences. It is the language used by professionals when they deal with their clients for the very simple reason that it's the only language the clients understand. Now, there's a very curious thing about that language. The vernacular refers very richly to feelings and states of mind. So that there is some reason to suspect that we are back with what psychologists have been looking for. However, if you examine the terms in the vernacular, you find that each one has a double meaning. I say, I'm hungry, and I think I'll get something to eat. Now, what am I saying? Am I mentioning a feeling, hunger, and am I talking about some cognitive process called thinking, or am I conveying to someone something about my personal history? To say I am hungry is to say, among other things, I haven't eaten for some time. To say I am hungry, among other things, says if you give me some food, I'll probably eat it. The, the terms in the vernacular which seem to refer to feelings and states of mind are really talking about contingencies of reinforcement, about the world and about its effect on people. Three years ago, I published a paper in The American Psychologist. I've had much too much I've had too great a share of that journal, I'm, I'm afraid. But it was called The Origins of Cognitive Thought. In it, I considered perhaps 80, 70, or 80 words 
each of which referred on the one hand to a mental process of some kind, but on the other uh, to a purely physical kind of thing, either to the kind of situation in which a person finds himself or herself, or the uh, contingencies which uh, are operating to select behavior appropriate to that situation. The, there are, I, in my own experience, some 1,500 words that have that double meaning. Now what has happened, I think, is that psychology has split in two ways. One part going in the direction of finding out the essence of the feeling, the essence of the cognitive process, and the other going in the direction of references to contingencies or reinforcement. The psychologist who is a professional, who is, who is a practitioner, uses the vernacular of his, his or her clients to find out more about what has happened to them and what they are probably going to do. The psychologist who claims to be a scientist investigating, searching for an inner originating creative or originating in initiating self is quite different and is doing quite different things. What has happened, I think, is that psychology has advanced as a practice, as a profession, far more rapidly than as a science. It began as a science, that is, it began as an effort to discover what was going on inside the mind or the self. But as the membership of this organization shows, it was the people who were interested in that particular topic soon became the minority. They were not only replaced by the professionals, but by a psychologist who didn't care too much about what was going on inside, but were interested in behavior, not necessarily as behaviorists, in teaching psychology, uh, clinical psychology, developmental psychology, and so on. And those became important sciences quite apart from an effort to isolate an originating mind or self. The whole notion of selection by consequences seems extremely difficult uh, to understand. We've seen what has happened in evolution. It is still true that biology cannot be properly taught in America because those who call themselves creationists or creation scientists oppose it as some kind of threat. If I say that psychologists in searching for this inner self or mind have wasted their time, you may feel that I am being arrogant. If I say that the philosophers who over the centuries have tried to discover themselves in that sense, that I am being arrogant. But I would call your attention to the fact that equally or even more brilliant men and women over a much longer period of time have been trying to establish the existence of and the nature of a different creator. In this case spelled with a capital C. Now, that is a very great problem. And you know how difficult it has been for natural selection to be accepted. Imagine how difficult it is going to be for the individual selection by consequences of operant behavior or the other 
in evolution of cultures and the other kinds of selection which take over the role of a creative self or mind. So far as I'm concerned, cognitive science is the creationism of psychology. It is an effort to It is an effort to reinstate that inner initiating, originating, creative self or mind, which in a scientific analysis simply does not exist. I think this association has been through a recent trial just because of this difference. Uh, it has, as you know, suffered a kind of secession by cognitive psychologists who are unhappy by when they associate with so many practitioners. And I would regard it not as a success, as a secession, but as an improvement. I think, <laughs> I, I think, I think it is time for psychology as a profession and as a science in such fields as psychotherapy, education, developmental psychology, and all the rest. It is time to realize that the science which it will be most helpful is not cognitive science searching for the inner mind or self, but selection by consequences represented by behavior analysis. Uh, Looking back, looking back on my life, uh, 62 years as a psychologist, I would say that what I have tried to do, what I've been doing, is to make that point clear, to show how selection by consequences in the individual can be demonstrated in the laboratory with animals and with human subjects, and to show this, the implications of that for the world at large in not only the profession of psychology, but in consideration of what is going to happen to the world unless some very vital changes are made. Any evidence that I have been successful in that is what I should like to be remembered by. I'll once again thank you for this award and for your attention.